Hello, I'm Brendan Quinn, Senior Manager, Communications at Campaign Legal Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's book discussion, Barriers to the Ballot Box, a conversation with author Gilda Daniels. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Today, CLC Vice President Paul Smith and Gilda R. Daniels, CLC's voting rights consultant and author of the book, Uncounted, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America, will discuss the obstacles, obstacles to vote in communities across the nation and how we can help all Americans exercise their right to vote. First, I'd like to introduce Paul Smith. Paul has more than four decades of experience litigating a wide range of cases. He has argued before the U.S. Supreme Court 21 times and has secured new, numerous victories, including in important cases advancing civil liberties. He is also a professor at Georgetown Law. Next, please welcome Gilda Daniels, an expert on voting rights who served as deputy chief in the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division voting section in both the Clinton and Bush administrations. She has more than two decades of voting rights experience, bringing cases that involve various provisions of the Voting Rights Act, the National Voter Registration Act, and other voting rights statutes. Before I turn this over to Paul, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. First, please use the comment section on Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn to submit your questions. At the end of the discussion, we will do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer every question. If we are not able to answer your question today, please email info at campaignlegal.org. Info at campaignlegal.org. Now, I would like to turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, uh, joining me today, as Brendan noted, is Gilda Daniels, the author of a great book, Uncounted, The Crisis of Votes, Voter Suppression in America. I've got to hold it up so it's visible. <laughs> Um, and uh, I want to talk about various aspects of this book with Gilda, who is a noted expert on voting rights and vote suppression. We're going to focus the discussion today on tactics being deployed now in the 21st century to prevent Americans from exercising their freedom to vote and how we fight for comprehensive solutions that would protect the right of voters to participate in our democracy. So with both what are the problems and what are the solutions? So what's, here's the Pretty obvious first question, Gilda. Why did you uh, decide to write this book? You want to tell us what motivated you to write Uncounted and why you thought this was the right moment for the country to hear about this problem? Great. Thanks so much, Paul and Campaign Legal Center, for this opportunity. Uh, so, you know, as you know, I've been uh, in the voting rights arena, and it feels like an arena. <laughs> it is an arena, yes. <laughs> Uh, for more than, I mean, you've been in, in it for four decades. I'm almost at three decades. So I'm, I was astounded when I actually counted it up. And so I've been certainly been uh, doing voting rights for quite some time. And um, I was certainly motivated uh, to write the book because I felt like there was a need to what I call connect the dots. So as a, as a child, I really like those connect the dot pages. I don't know if folks remember those where, you, you know, it's just numbers on a page and you have to connect the dots. You have to go from one to two to three to four to five, right? And and, and you'll get a picture, It'll be a picture of a flower, a house, a, a car or something of that sort. And if you don't connect the dots in order, then you get a distorted picture, right? And so I felt like there was, that there was a need uh, to connect the dots, right? To There are people who are talking about voter ID and only voter ID or felon disenfranchisement and only felon disenfranchisement as ways that uh, were uh, impacting the right to vote. Um, but I felt there was a need to uh, talk about how all these things, how all these measures come together uh, to create uh, this widespread voter suppression. Because if you only look at voter ID, uh, then you say, oh, it's only affecting, you know, a thousand people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people, right? But when you think about, you know, voter ID plus felon disenfranchisement, plus voter purges, plus uh, you know, uh, the voter deception, right? All these things together, yeah. I think, create a clearer picture of what voter suppression looks like in the United States of America. 
So let's talk about some of the institutions that are allowing this uh, to happen or make it part of the problem when they should be part of the solution. There's been a lot of attention, of course, on the Supreme Court, uh, given cases like Shelby County versus Holder, where the court took down a big chunk of the Voting Rights Act. And it's done more of that since. But, you know, in your book, you also talk about how the lower courts and even the Department of Justice at times have been uh, supporting laws and policies that exclude voters from our democracy as well. Can you put that all together and maybe connect the dots? Talk about how the, these various players have combined to produce a situation where we have considerably less than equal access to voting for all Americans. Of course. So in, in the book, I talk about how certainly the courts have been complicit uh, the legislators have been complicit and they've all uh, essentially all of these things, right, as you're connecting the dots, have been working together to create um, uh, voter suppression. If we start with the uh, legislature and also and, and also a point that is throughout the book is that this is not the beginning. Right. This is not the first time this has happened, that this is historical, that that we continue to see these cycles of voter suppression. Uh, and certainly uh, in this, this cycle uh, since Shelby, right, since the, the uh, Shelby County decision and uh, since the Shelby, since the Shelby County decision, we've certainly seen an increase in voter suppression. Uh, and we've seen it particularly in the South and places where uh, places like Georgia, where you've seen uh, voter purges and you've seen communities that uh, have lacked notice, which was one of the uh, beauties of certainly Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is that it provided notice to the communities that a change was going to come, that there was a voting change, uh, that, uh, that, a, that a legislature, that a council, uh, county commission, city council uh, had passed, and that that change had to be uh, Considered had to be reviewed, had to be approved before it could go into effect, and the and the Department of Justice would, in fact, contact persons in those jurisdictions to say, "Hey, did you know that this change had been adopted?" Uh, and 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 to get their views on whether the change uh, would put them in a worse position. And you don't have that without Section Five. So now you have jurisdictions that are just making changes without uh, jurisdictions. Uh, having any notification and, and advocacy, what they're doing along the way. Yeah, right, the way right. And, through, but we didn't tell you, right? You know. Right, right, right. Or closing polling places and having these yeah. central locations where people have to go miles to uh, to actually have to one voting place, and people think, oh, where it's consolidated. It's like, yeah, but I used to be able to walk across the street right. to the school. Uh, to to vote, uh, and now I have to actually catch a bus and leave work and have someone to watch my children and those kinds of things. So you're making those kinds of changes without uh, persons having uh, any type of notice. And so those are certainly things that seem subtle, right? But they have a great impact on the ability of people to actually access um, the right to vote. It's not just uh, not not just uh, the Supreme Court, right? We certainly see it. On the local level of legislation, we've had, you know, uh, uh, an onslaught of legislation uh, recently that uh, that is making it harder for people to access uh, the right to vote in numbers that we certainly haven't seen probably since post Reconstruction. Right. Uh, and uh, there's and the and certainly there is a say in the book. There's a we have to fight to vote for the right to vote, and so it's a, it certainly is a constant fight to ensure that uh, we can access the right to vote. One, all one of the great things about the book is the way you, you provide some historical perspective about this and tell the story about how we went from Reconstruction to Jim Crow uh, and the, uh, the sort of old style vote suppression techniques that were so effective for so many decades. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, literacy tests or poll taxes or just refusing to register people. Right. Um, and I love the way you use the experience of your uh, relatives and ancestors and the stories mm -hmm. that each of them, you have about each of them trying to, through the generations, uh, right. penetrate the, uh, the barriers and, and vote. Uh, of course, now, as the book describes in detail, the, the, the old style barriers are no longer with us. We don't have a literacy tests. They've been banned a long time ago things like that, but there's kind of the new millennium uh, techniques of vote suppression that you talk about, some of which you've already touched on, and deception and other kinds. Um, a lot of uh, the story starts really after the 2000, the disaster of the 2000 presidential election and the, the effort to actually fix our election system, which itself spawned problems of its own. Why don't you talk a little bit about how that process occurred? 
Well, so then I talk about the cycles of voter suppression and that you have these, uh, you have these periods of, of, of progress that are followed by these short periods of regress, right? And you're looking at reconstruction where, you know, you have uh, uh, persons who are formerly enslaved get right to vote with the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, and they actually embrace it and register very high numbers, uh, elect people to federal, state, local positions. Uh, there are two African-Americans elected to the United States Senate in the in, from Mississippi. Stop, pause. <laughs> right? yeah, that's not right? happening anytime soon here. <laughs> right. And in that and, 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 and 2020 was the first time you actually had two African-Americans from the South since Reconstruction, right? And so you have to uh, think about certainly the power of, the, of, of voter suppression in that it was shortly after, certainly, um, certainly after that you saw that period of great progress, you had these laws that were passed, like the poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, grandfather clause and others that essentially eliminated uh, the right to vote for African-Americans in places like Alabama, where there were af uh, af uh, around 100,000, 140,000 African-Americans registered to vote uh, during the Reconstruction period after the passage of literacy tests and other measures. That number went from 140,000 to around 56, right, to like less than 50, around, around 50 uh, folks who were able to continue to vote. Uh, and so, and you, that was certainly reconstruction, post-reconstruction, right, with those measures, those legislative measures. And we see the same thing um, today. You had a period of great progress in 2020. You had a, a very high percentage of persons actually uh, turning out to vote, around 65% which is a very high number, but by no means should we, I mean, it's certainly to be celebrated, but we shouldn't rest on that, right? And and so you go from having that period of great progress to seeing all these laws that are being passed across the country that are meant, that have the intention of uh, making it harder for people to vote and certainly uh, lowering the numbers uh, of, of persons who actually access the ballot. Right, so, and, and you also talk about how, you know, after the 2000 election, the, the Help America Vote Act was supposed to make it the system better. In, but one of the things it did paradoxically is give rise to uh, this movement toward voter IDs and the underlying um, justification that had to be made, made up for those voter ID laws, which is that there's tons of fraud at the polling place, people voting in, under somebody else's name, so-called voter impersonation fraud. Uh, and uh, one should elaborate a little bit more on how that story played out. Well, certainly while I was at the Department of Justice, we saw, we I think we saw a movement uh, from uh, certainly enforcing <laughs> the Voting Rights Act to this issue of uh, voter fraud, and certainly it being it, it was it was during the Bush admin the second Bush administration, um, it was given heightened importance, and we actually were uh, in the actually uh, using part of the time at DOJ in the voting section to train folk on voter fraud and how to make sure that we can identified and that's that's not the role of the no. department of, of the civil rights division voting section right the role of the civil a rights bad division. period yeah the role <laughs> of the civil rights division voting section is to enforce the the federal uh voting laws like the nvra the national voter registration act like act like the help america vote act and certainly like the voting rights act or what remains of the voting rights act yeah. and so that was that was certainly a very difficult a period, but we certainly have seen the seeds of that period blossom uh, to what we to what we're experiencing today. Where uh, and you have courts that are saying, "Okay, let's just say voter fraud, and that's enough." Yeah, okay. Supreme Court in particular says, "If you tell us there's fraud, we're going to believe you. We don't have to have any evidence of it." And that's right. that kind yeah, of yeah. started with the Crawford case upholding voter ID Absolutely. laws, uh, and it's continued right through as the as the claims of fraud have only magnified in, in the Trump era. But, Absolutely. And you argue Crawford. Yeah, no, one of the things about reading this book is I realize all the cases I should have won that I didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It's really painful. <laughs> um, the, uh, one of the other topics in the book is, is deception uh, of yes. voters done by politicians and others. And there's various types of it that you catalog. Uh, some of it the old fashioned tell people to vote the wrong day kind of stuff. And some right. of it more connected to things like this voter fraud claim. One, one should talk about why you, you focus on deception. 
Well, I thought it was very important to include a chapter on voter deception and really so to really highlight the various ways that it plays out, certainly some of the more common ways. And I don't think people really see it as a voter suppression tactic. Right. And I certainly think that voter deception is a voter suppression tactic because it impacts the ability of people to actually get out and vote. Right. Because if you're distributing flyers through African-American neighborhoods that say you cannot uh, vote if you have outstanding child support and outstanding traffic tickets, right? Folk <laughs> reading those like, well, I'm not going over there to get harassed by, <laughs> you know, yeah. the person. Right? So, so it does, it does impact the ability of people uh, to, 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 uh, to actually access the, access the right to vote. And one of the things I talk about in the book is it really, it's really hard to quantify, right? It's hard to, to determine how many people were dissuaded from right. participating because of, an email or a you know a, a, a tweet or something of that sort that that was clear clearly included deception or what people are calling misinformation and disinformation uh and yeah. so those things are those are certainly tools that are being used i i tried to distinguish certainly voter deception from political deception i think one of the things i say in the book is that you know you, you i think certain politicians have turned uh deception they've turned certainly the First Amendment protection for freedom of speech, and that political speech is giving the highest level, sure. right? Yeah. And, 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 and so you, and so folk uh, have certainly uh, utilized political speech, and have, and and, and politicians have actually Im started to utilize it as their right, as opposed to the right of citizens to 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 uh, cr criticize the government or to speak against the government, right? And so you, it, political deception has just been, has essentially turned uh, the First Amendment protection on its head and we've, we're protecting, well, well, I say that you uh, certainly have a right to political speech. You don't have a right to lie, <laughs> which is, the, and, and we don't have, we don't have the mechanisms in place in our government to really address um, that issue because we are, uh, you know, wrapping ourselves in the First Amendment and allowing people to say things that are just not true and that uh, certainly uh, impact people's um, ability to uh, go to the polls because they don't think that they should or that there's voter fraud. Just saying they're voting fraud, voter fraud, and 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 we don't have uh, we don't have enough uh, uh, ability to certainly ensure that speech. Uh, is protected, right? Uh, true political speech is protected, and what we've been doing is certainly protecting this misinformation and disinformation. Right. As right. So you know what people hear every day that uh, that there's massive fraud and elections are rigged, and uh, they they may decide not to vote at all. Or right. they, and then if you combine that with this other kind of deception you mentioned, which is you you should you should know if you vote, somebody may figure out that you have this this uh, you know criminal warrant out for you or you owe child support or you're going to get arrested for one thing or another that that you that those kinds of threats go way back but they are right. they continue to this day it's it's a, a a major additional strategy on top of things like laws that make it hard to register laws that make it hard to stay registered laws right. that make it uh, right. hard to, you know, have to have certain identification and citizenship proof and all kinds of stuff right. speaking of oh, oh go ahead I was just saying that there are very few, you know, cases that have been brought. You know, there's a case in Maryland that was brought on about robocalls several years ago uh, that, that were certainly in, and it included disinformation. That was, was the wrong information, mm -hmm. uh, essentially telling people, don't worry, I've already won. You don't have to go vote. <laughs> right. And so but if it could be traced back to a political campaign and that's how they actually could actually bring a case yeah. but a lot of these a lot of this disinformation and misinformation does not get prosecuted and certainly on the federal level there aren't a lot of tools uh that can that can address it there are more tools for vote intimidation but there have been very few uh cases brought uh there have been very few voter intimidation cases brought as well so there needs to be i think that it certainly needs to be a, a focus on how we can uh, certainly ensure that uh, the truth <laughs> yeah. is uh, certainly facts, right? As opposed to this hyperbole, as opposed to hyperbole, which is what we hear uh, more of. Uh, certainly, what's what's being in the in the, in the space, as opposed to uh, what we're currently uh, being. Yeah. 
the current pol political dialogue is not very edifying. No, uh, no. So one of the things you talk about uh, that I found really interesting in the book is, is the sort of underlying motivation for a lot of this being the fact that the country's demographics are changing so dramatically as we move from being a very uh, super majority white country to being a country where people of color will be, be in the majority extremely soon. Uh, that provides a, a strong motivating factor, uh, I mean, comparable in a way to the fact that there was such a high percentage of the population in the Deep South and the Jim Crow era that were African American. Mm -hmm. Now the whole country is becoming much more diverse, uh, mm -hmm. and there is this sense that uh, the the reasons why people are pushing back so hard against the, the idea that everyone should be able to vote is they don't want everybody to vote. It, it's a, it's a, it's, this is why this problem is not going to go away anytime right. soon in part. Well, you know, Frederick Douglass said power concedes nothing uh -huh. without a struggle. And so it, it, it certainly voting rights is all about power. Who has it? Uh, and, and certainly who's, who, who can attain it. Right. And so you certainly have in, in particularly in the South, you have people who have migrated from the north back to the south, uh, and you have growing numbers of people of color throughout uh, throughout uh, throughout the south, particularly in places like Texas, where they gained a congressional seat primarily because of the growth in, of people of color, uh, the growing numbers of people of color in the state. Yet when they draw a district, <laughs> they did not add an addition. They do that every ten years down there. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So there are so the, the the demographics are changing, and we certainly saw that in 2020 with the elections of Senator Ossoff and Senator Warnock, where in places like Georgia, where a, a, more than a third of the voters are are African American, and certainly people of color voters are probably range up to almost 40 percent. So uh, there's there is there are increasing numbers. Uh, and uh, that, and I, we're seeing that the certainly with things like voter ID. If you go to voter ID, particularly in Georgia, when Georgia passed voter ID in 2006, when I was in the uh, when I was in the voting section, certainly one of the things they did was they said that there were only a few pieces of identification that were acceptable, and one of it was military ID, passport. Um, and uh, driver's license, right? But there was there was data that approximately 25% of African Americans did not own a car. Right. So if you know that 25% of African Americans don't own a car, why would you make a driver's license one of the few pieces of acceptable identification? When you would certainly in, in Georgia and other places, you could use a, a gas bill, a utility bill, a, a piece of mail that had your address on it, right? But instead, you you decrease the acceptable forms of uh, identification so that you can decrease the numbers of persons who can actually participate. Right. No, and the trick is always to find ways to target particular populations, find make rules that have a disparate impact on African Americans or Latinos, or Latinos or whatever. Because that's how you get a political victory out of it and then end up uh, uh, being subversive of, of democracy itself. And, and in I the think, past, we've, we've been able to have the courts have, have been have been helpful in places like North Carolina, where the court said they use surgical precision. Right. They right. essentially said, what means do people of color utilize to, to access the right to vote? Oh, they go to polls on Sundays. They, then we're going to we're going to eliminate Sunday, <laughs> Sunday voting. Uh, and so. Well, yeah, I and mean, you could, and the courts recognize that with all of the data that had to be produced. Uh, but now, courts are like, okay, thank you for the data. <laughs> but they said it's voter fraud. That's <laughs> enough. So, yeah. so learning, you know, figuring out how to combat that is certainly the, yeah, the, the justification, even if it's obviously fraudulent, is about Absolutely. fraud. Uh, right. It gets accepted. It's really ironic. Um, it's quite. So let's talk about some solutions you talk about in the book. Uh, it's not all about problems. You, 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 you call action here to try to fix things, uh, which of course you're one of the many people out there trying to do, which we appreciate. Uh, we, the Constitution itself, as you know, it has a lot of protections against discrimination in voting. Uh, but you don't think that the Constitution is enough as it is written. You think it needs to be improved by the addition of a new amendment 
directly guaranteeing the right to vote. What, tell, tell us why you think that would be important to do. Well, one of the things that I talk about is certainly that, you know, we certainly have more uh, constitutional amendments that address the right to vote than any other right yeah. in the Constitution. And yet we have more, certainly state legislators and others have taken more opportunities to <laughs> to certainly uh, uh, diminish the right to vote uh, in their in their states, and if you, you know, if you look at how it's unfortunately easier to get a gun than it is to register, and then that's in, in part is because of certainly the protections that the court has recognized, the Supreme Court has recognized in regards to the Second Amendment, right? That you, you know, essentially says that the Congress and others cannot a- address the ability to own a gun, notwithstanding the part about the militia. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then for uh, so you have a lot of thou shalt not with in regards to the uh, right to vote that thou shalt not discriminate based on race or or age or gender. Uh, right. Thou shalt not use a poll tax. Right. All those you have all those constitutional amendments. But there's there is not an affirmative right to vote in the. United States Constitution. And there are certainly uh, those of us, there are scholars who believe that if there was an affirmative right, that it could curtail the ability of uh, of state legislators to certainly limit uh, the right to vote. Right. So that's certainly an argument that we can continue to have because there are certainly things that must be done, we think, to to ensure that the right to vote is protected. And certainly I think having an affirmative right to vote in the United States Constitution would go a long way to help. And, and, and the, the point, I guess, is that in the absence of an affirmative right, you just get a very low standard of protection when somebody comes in and says this law is just too burdensome on the right to vote. The contrast you mentioned in the Second Amendment, the, another contrast that could be drawn is with the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. And you talk about how the protections for political speech are incredibly high and the Supreme Court aggressively enforces those to protect all kinds of uh, speech, including uh, the spending of lots of money in campaign finance, but when it comes to the right to vote, burdens on the right to vote, they they apply a kind of a loose balancing test that's hard to make right. use effectively, right? So that th- th- this is the reason why this particular remedy has come to the fore, and a lot of voting rights advocates are, are uh, talking about it. Not, not just you, but certainly it's, it's an important point that you make in the book. Can I also point out that certainly this is what this is one of the issues certainly with people who uh, subscribe to originalism, right? Because originally. <laughs> People of color were counted as less than, right? Through the three fifths clause, you have the three fifths clause, and all men are created equal. And so, in many ways, they continue to go back to that concept, right? And in, in, right. in, in justifying um, limiting the right to vote. This is like there are literally two constitutions, right? People consider the original founding fathers document and then the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments and the additional amendments. And so, there need, certainly needs to be some affirmations attached to uh, the right to vote because it is not treated as fundamental. No. Right? It's right to right to speech is fundamental, but the the right to vote is fundamental, certainly fundamental to our democracy. And we need to center the right to vote, certainly within our democratic principles, as well as um, certainly with, within our constitution. And, you know, things like the Equal Protection Clause and the, and the 15th Amendment ban on discrimination voting, those get watered down by the same originalists. So they say basically, well, but there's fraud, so we have to have, you know, we have to allow things even when they have a disparate impact like voter ID laws. It's, right. And there's no, and, 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 the, and the, the way that the courts have heightened states' rights is really, as I said in the book, that we do have these cycles, it's really likened unto what we saw previously, right, where the, what, where the state decided essentially that Black people couldn't register, Black people couldn't vote. And they did that on a very local level. And so giving out, giving the power to the states and saying that the states, under the elections clause, that the states have the power to, to determine, certainly in time, place, and manner yeah. of voting. And uh, it's it's really, it, there's there has been less attention to how that impacts, certainly the ability to um, cast a ballot. Not by all Americans, but certainly by um, people of color, disabled people, elderly people, young people, right? And so you're, you, the, the more you, um, um, the more you certainly create laws that impact those various categories of 
individuals, the more, the higher the numbers of persons that will be disenfranchised. Right. Yeah. So you use a, a, a coin, a, a term in your book, which I think you previously coined in some other writings, which is uh, voting realism. Uh, can you tell us what you mean by that and what the underlying point is that you're making with that term? Well, I actually, I actually teach uh, critical race theory at uh, as a professor at the University of Baltimore, along with other with election law and other courses. Sure. And um, so uh, Professor Derek Bell coined the term racial realism. And so I thought I would use uh, voting realism. Uh, racial realism essentially says that um, we should just at all, instead of trying to convince someone that racism exists, what Professor Bell suggested is that we should all try to achieve essentially the higher goal of, of being more creative in regards to the kinds of mechanisms that we can adopt that will address racism. Because he, he essentially, in, in regards to racial realism, said we're wasting our time trying to convince people that racism exists. Uh, and what, which is likened to while we we're continually trying to convince people that voting discrimination or voter suppression exists, right. instead of trying to say, "But let, wait, there's voter suppression," <laughs> then why not we uh, tr try to strategize and think about ways in which we can address what we already see as a reality, right? Which yeah. is uh, voter suppression, and come up with more creative ways. Um, things that go beyond, well, let's let's uh, reauthorize or let's restore uh, parts of the Voting Rights Act. That's that's wonderful, and that is certainly something that needs to be done. Yeah. But what can we do more than that, right? So right. let's see. And part of it is the idea that well, you can't just say, well, we're going to treat everybody the same uh, and expect the outcome to be the same when you have a, a two centuries of oppression that you that have occurred and, and produced the disparities in economic situations and lots of other things that cause people to respond, even in a, without affirmative vote suppression, to vote less or to have big, big, bigger difficulty voting. But right. um, the uh, but 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 so can you give us an example of a, of a creative thing you would do on top of restoring the Voting Rights Act? Is there a specific uh, kind of law you think that ought to be passed? Well, one, another uh, one of my writings, I talk about voter impact statements. Uh -huh. which are similar to uh, uh, environmental impact statements. And so essentially with an environmental, with a, with an environment, environmental impact statement, the jurisdiction once it's be before it can pass the um, legislation that impacts the community, it has, it has actually has, has to tell you how it will impact the community, right? And give the community an opportunity to Respond, and I think the certain, right. certainly the same thing should be done with voting laws. If a jurisdiction is trying to pass a law that impacts the right to vote or access to the right to vote, then before it can pass, then there has to be the, that the jurisdiction needs to um, determine what the impact would be on its uh, citizens, as opposed to what we see now, which is anecdotal. Right? It's like I heard there was voter fraud in a state. <laughs> somewhere in the Southwest and we're in the Northeast or whatever, right. right? Instead of that, that there's actually like, there's a study, there's some, you take some effort in, in determining how this might impact um, the right to vote before it can uh, uh, go into effect. And that there's a, some waiting period as opposed to what we've seen lately is legislature passes, you know, this massive uh, voting rights, legislation and the governor signs it the next day right? right instead of that how about a period where there's that where the communities the affected communities the persons in the state have an opportunity to actually look at the legislation and uh, speak to it right hold forums those kinds of things so so i think that certainly that helps uh, it gives power helps you know power sees nothing without a struggle it certainly would help to empower communities, uh, empower voters uh, to ensure that they have a voice certainly in the process that goes beyond certainly the voting booth. And oh. we've certainly seen recently that people are saying, you know, with efforts, certainly with the Dobbs decision and other decisions, people are saying, well, make sure you go to the polls. That is important. Uh, however, I think that we have to think more creatively about 
uh, just it's not just going to the polls. It is the process. It's it's a 365, 24, 7 process, right? That it's not just going at midterms or during presidential elections. It's what's happening on the local level, uh, going to school board meetings, going to city council meetings, county commission meetings, uh, registering to vote, knowing what the laws are in your uh, jurisdiction, uh, encouraging people to vote. Uh, the NAACP used to say each one reach one, each one teach one, and everybody, you know, you, everyone had to bring a certain number of people to the polls with them. So those, I think those are kinds of uh, mechanisms that we need to uh, have in place uh, that can help address certainly this uh, the, the state that we're currently in. Thanks for that. That's really interesting. Uh, one other topic that I think we should touch on while we, before we get to some questions um, is uh, felon disenfranchisement, which is massively significant in yes. terms of keeping people from being able to vote, and it has a horribly dis disparate impact on people of color, of course. Absolutely. Uh, so talk about what, what you what, what you what you say about that subject in the book and how you would fix it and what, what the strategies are to fix it. Well, I, I say in the book that. Uh, certainly that felon disenfranchisement is a modern day three-fifths clause. And, and if you do the math, it's approximately the same percentage of persons who are impacted, certainly with felon disenfranchisement in places like Florida, where almost 20 percent of African-Americans do not have the right to vote because of felon disenfranchisement laws in Florida. Uh, and when you think about, you know, it is massive when you think about a million people not having the right to vote in a state like Florida because they uh, haven't paid outstanding fines or, uh, you know, or I think uh, Desmond Mead uh, tells the story about how the, uh, a, uh, releasing a helium balloon is a felony that could lose your right to vote in the state of Florida, right? So, because when we think about felonies of enchantment, I think people think about rapists and murderers. But no, we're talking about people who didn't pay a, didn't pay a bill associated with their automobile. <laughs> or something of that sort, or a helium balloon. Uh, you know, in Alabama at one time, if you if you bounced two checks in excess of one hundred dollars, you lost your right to vote. Yeah. Right? How many people have done that, right? So when you think about, it, so those are the people who are being blocked from the uh, voting rights booth. Uh, that I think that helps us to, I think it helps us to think about how we can change the change the situation where. Uh, certainly returning citizens should have the opportunity to uh, participate uh, in the in the voting process and eliminating certainly the barriers that that um, that that now stand in that stand in the way. And litigation has not been, as you know, unfortunately, litigation has not been successful, but there has been great success on uh, the on the legislative level. And yeah. that's where it, that's where I think the that's where I think the difference will be made. It, it does seem like there's a popular movement to try to get rid of these these policies, but it, it's hard to accomplish it. In part, we, we have our Restore Your Vote program at CLC, and one of the things we're really acutely aware of is there's also millions of people out there who have uh, some kind of a crime they've committed in their background who have the right to vote right now and just don't know it. Uh, and it's, the states are not exactly encouraging them to find out. So, you, you know, the uh, a lot of education is necessary. There could be a huge... Um, Absolutely. Amount of resources devoted just to getting people to understand what the rules are, uh, and there might be five or ten million people who could be voting right now and don't believe they have the right. It's quite remarkable. Absolutely right. And the Campaign Legal Center does a, a remarkable job. Blair is doing a great oh, job, for them making sure that uh, yeah. folks know. Um, so l let's um, talk a little bit about Congress, and then we'll take some questions. What would you have Congress do now uh, if you had, if you were in charge of Congress? What would you tell them to do right now to sort of fix the situation? So, Paul, there's this movie uh, John Q starring Denzel Washington, and there's a scene where the wife tells John Q, "Do something." <laughs> Just do. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that is what I would tell Congress: do something. Yeah. It's there actually. Uh, do something in regards to uh, uh, voting rights, and you know, and 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 stick to it. It's like make up your mind and and keep it made up, right? And so um, that would just tell them to do something. They are looking at the Electoral Count Act, which in the Campaign Legal Center was certainly at the forefront of pushing, which is important, certainly to addressing 
uh, addressing some issues, but it has the, the Congress has to do something in regards to certainly how how quickly the Voting Rights Act is diminishing. <laughs> it is it is uh, you know, the, and particularly and need to and, and there needs there's a need to address certainly what the Supreme Court is doing or may do. Uh, in the future, right? It's already essentially eliminated Section Five of the Voting Rights Act, and now it has its sights set on right. Section Two. And yeah. Congress needs to do something if we're not going to restore Section Five or shore up certainly the Voting Rights Act, create a new uh, piece of legislation that will ensure that uh, all Americans have free, fair, free and fair access to the right to vote, as well as some assurances that the vote you cast will be counted <laughs> in the way that you intended, right? So there are a number of things that Congress could do. You so know, it's, it's, we had this moment um, just a year or so ago when we had the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and right. they had passed the House and they had 50 votes in the Senate, and if there had been a way to get over the filibuster, you, it's, it's remarkable how many of the problems you talk about would have been solved right. just by those two pieces of legislation. Uh, right. And so there are there are tools that Congress has. They just need a better Congress. I'm afraid that's the uh, it, 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 that's the reality. Yeah, uh, yeah they met just essentially, as I said, do something because there are there are measures there. That Congress has power, but is refusing to utilize it. And, right, and, and it, it's the institution that needs to step up when the Supreme Court becomes much more part of the problem. Than absolutely, part of the because, because because now the Supreme Court has outsized importance, right? When right. when when the when the legis when the Congress is not uh, operating as it should, um, and and you and you have hampered certainly the executive. Right. Uh, then certainly the judiciary is like, okay, we can do this. <laughs> so yeah. Congress needs to do something. Back, we'll take down this piece of the law and then we'll take down that, that one. That's what's been going on. Absolutely. Remarkable. So let's see what our audience uh, has to, to say, whether we have some questions. Um, I think uh, Kim is going to flash a few for us here. If uh, First one uh, from Stephen Spitz. What, if anything, has happened with respect to enforcement of state voting rights mm -hmm. laws, such as in Virginia, where the General Assembly passed a law requiring preclearance of election changes? Oh, that's a question for you, Paul. You can answer <laughs> that question. That's right. With the well, there is a new Voting Rights Act in Virginia, and it does require preclearance. It's fairly new. Uh, the, uh, the the ultimate hasn't been used a lot of times as a result, but uh, mm -hmm. because it you know applies when laws are changed. But uh, we we were very much in favor of it at Campaign Legal Center, uh, and um, in the right hands. The, the, the current state government may not be the most aggressive enforcers of it, but the, the, uh, in the right hands, it could be a very effective uh, a remedy. And mm -hmm. you know, this is an example, uh, and you mentioned this certainly too, uh, Gilda, that it's not just Congress. Uh, states can do things. They can both be problems and solutions at the state level as well. Uh, and states are, are passing the state level voting rights acts, even as other states are busily passing laws like the ones in Georgia and Arizona and Texas that are just Absolutely. trying to keep people from voting. It all depends and, on which you're in, and that's and that's why it's very important for uh, for all of us to be vigilant about yeah. what laws are being passed, what rules are in place. Certainly, as we get ready to go to the polling place in November, or before, certainly during early voting, um, and, and so that we can learn how we might access it and and what protections we can have, like a new preclearance law in in the state of Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's great to see that kind of pro voting development happening Absolutely. in a southern state like Virginia. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. All right. Another question, Kim? Professor Daniels. This one's got your name on it, so you do have to answer it this. It sure one. does. Uh, how would you encourage communities to push back when being targeted by elected officials to win black votes in exchange for superficial economic empowerment? Encourage disenfranchisement to push when being targeted by elected officials to win black votes in exchange for superficial economic empowerment. Well, who, this person is, is on top of all of this. So um, it sounds like, so this question is essentially asking, essentially when people, people are asking for your vote yet, uh, they're not, you're not seeing certainly um, results in the community, things that there are certainly things, I think something that we uh, talked about, I think Paul, we were talking about a piece of legislation where certainly, we, we, unfortunately, I think a lot of uh, 
um, elected officials are in the ceremonial gestures. <laughs> Um, as a policy, right, or, or, or a certain amount of money gets put into one little project in the in the right. what that part of the state, but it doesn't actually change the economic position of the community. Right at, at all, and so I think it. I think it's incumbent upon uh, not only dis disenfranchised communities, but all persons certainly to. Hey, I tell people to do a couple things: educate, legislate, litigate, participate. <laughs> so educate yourselves about so things knowing that certainly that there are elected officials who are using certainly uh, economic empowerment as and, and many of them are you just using it as a catchphrase and not to some extent using it as a catchphrase as opposed to really having programs that will provide um, uh, will, that will actually make a difference in uh, people's lives and so Put, uh, power concede. I've said it this is probably the third time. Power concedes nothing. So, meeting with those elected officials, and I. So, so what I would encourage uh, people to do is participate. Certainly, educate yourselves about certainly these programs that are available, or 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 uh, legislation that is being pushed. Um, know what the legislation is, and certainly. Uh, speak to the legislation, educate uh, others about what the uh, legislation is and participate, right? And the participation part comes with, you can certainly um, uh, use your vote as your voice and certainly encourage people. I encourage people to actually um, utilize um, the, the right to vote to certainly um, say to elected officials, that they're not representing you uh, appropriately, and I think that's something. So that's something that, particularly in places like Florida and Georgia and other places where people people are particularly not happy with certainly some of the legislation that's gone forward. Guess what? The entire state legislature is up for re-election this year in Georgia and in Florida. So it would be incumbent upon all of us to certainly work to elect people who would be more representative. Right. And that would certainly see would, would, would work to enfranchise those uh, disenfranchised communities and to provide uh, real change and real programs that would certainly achieve the goals, um, certainly that the community, the community, yeah. community might have. Real reform as opposed to superficial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question, Kim. Does the book treat vote dilution and or racial gerrymandering as a distinctly separate phenomenon? How would you compare this, the threat of those with narrowly defined vote denial tactics? Uh, do you have a discussion of, of uh, Section 2 districting problems and other kinds of vote denial in, in the book? Uh, I do talk, certainly talk about uh, vote, di vote dilution. I talk about the difference between vote denial um, cases and vote dilution cases. I don't talk a lot about racial gerrymandering. I do have like the Gamillion versus Lightwood, Lightfoot case in the, <laughs> which is yeah, like a just classic <laughs> racial uh, gerrymandering. Uh, and um, so, I, I so in I think because so, in my mind I was thinking racial. Uh, uh, um, Redistricting is another book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as, as Todd points out, it's an important and distinctly separate problem. If yeah. you can, everybody gets to vote, but they're packed into a couple of districts where they don't get anywhere near their share of representation. And as you mentioned already in this hour, uh, Gilda, the Supreme Court has right now before it a case out of Alabama right. involving that just that question. It's a very worrisome case. Uh, and it, it, it involved the, the, the situation where the lower federal court um, said uh, you have to have a second African American majority congressional district out of seven in Alabama, right. which again is still less than their proportional share uh, under Section Two of the Voting Rights Act. And it's, it's state came back with all kinds of constitutional arguments that seem to be getting taken seriously by some of the justices. A very scary thing that this it other is. big protection we've had for all these decades seems to be on the chopping block. Then Alabama, Alabama is ground central for voter suppression. Right? No, I've heard that. Yeah, <laughs> from, Shel from Shelby County to certainly this. this well, you can, don't you can go back a lot farther than that. There's this case, okay. Giles versus Harris from 1906. Absolutely, Absolutely. Uh, right. So it has always course, been yeah. for for whatever reason, right? Alabama is the place where voting rights is certainly, you know, has 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 had a, a an, an immense struggle, and right. this and as you say, this. Uh, 
uh, upcoming case is somewhat pro problematic because it's there in the first place, right? Uh, it, it really shouldn't uh, be in, be there in the first place, particularly since you know the court used the Purcell principle to 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 put the 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 racially gerrymandered. Uh, certainly, it's not. I don't, I don't think the the court used the Purcell principle to actually uh, allow the state to continue with a plan that the lower court said was racially discriminatory. Yeah, and it's just. No. It's, an example of how certainly the rights of the people is certainly being sub subordinated to the state's rights, uh, which is, which again, we're turning the constitution on its head. I think we have time for one more question. If there's one, Kim. George Lyon. What do you think about, uh, what do you think that we the people can do to ensure that voters in our communities have the information they need in an informed manner, to vote in an informed manner and be more civically engaged? Well, that's a, that's a big question. If you can get that's that done. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's, it's a, a great question, right? When it, and I think, I believe in the power of the people. And I, I, and I also believe that the people don't recognize the power that, um, we actually have, right? That, that we have great power. And that is not only in uh, numbers in regards to uh, in, in, in getting out to vote, but it's also in, we, we, we can uh, engage in multiplication, right? So you can multiply certainly your impact by um, speaking at your community organizations, at your churches, your synagogues, your mosques, right? And in and encouraging people to um, register, which is what we we're probably where the focus needs to be right now, making sure that people are registered, uh, and then whatever barriers they might have, helping them to overcome those barriers to to registration, uh, uh, whether it's you know having the proper ID or um, uh, you know or or some other issues, making sure that we can that we the people certainly can use the power that we have to uh, help others uh, to uh, uh, ensure that they can participate uh, in the process and become more civically engaged. And I think it's, again, it's a part of, uh, Georgia, it's a part of connecting the dots, right? Because as I say to my teenager, you're concerned about climate change, guess what? Folk on the state level, folk on the congressional level, they're the ones who are going to create laws that are either going to make it better or make it worse. You have the power to determine who those people are, right? Particularly right. young people. And I think that young people, certainly young people need to uh, connect the dots in that way. Folk are uh, upset about the Dobbs decision and people are saying, oh, well, the president gets to uh, select uh, Supreme Court justices and people are saying, well, the president's not up for election this year. So you have to walk them through why it's important that there's a you know that you know, we elect United States senators and those United States senators get to select get to devote, get to vote on whether or not a person is in the United States uh, 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 Supreme Court. So that's so being civically engaged means that we all have to be I think civically mature <laughs> because uh, we have to recognize certainly uh, how all these things come together and certainly the the, the part that um, uh, encouraging people to participate and actually uh, voting, uh, that the part that that has, the part that that has in ensuring that we can actually create change, right? And create uh, the country that we, we want to live in. That is a true uh, democracy where everyone has certainly the right to vote and the right to um, a fair, free uh, 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 access to uh, the polling place. But and and that's that's the country, the kind of country we want. But as as you've mentioned many times in this past hour, and thank you for that, a lot of this it requires organizing, getting people led and educated and taught, and because any one voter by themselves can't do anything. You have to we have to work together toward a common goal with a real understanding of what's at stake. Uh, and so your book is a really great um, introduction and discussion of all of the ways in which that's hard to do in, in the world that we now live in, and, but also 
is full of solutions and, and hope at the end. So uh, absolutely, I am I am hopeful. This is, this is uh is hopeless. So let me let me conclude by saying thank you to Gilda, our wonderful guest, and all of you for joining us today. Our country's democracy works best when every voter can exercise the freedom to vote in safe and accessible elections. That's what we all should want, and that's what we all should work for. And there's no substitute for doing the work to get that done. If you have any additional questions or would like more information, please email us at info at campaignlegalcenter.org. And thank you again, and have a wonderful afternoon, uh, Professor Daniels. Thank you, sir.